Welcome to Her Story on a Plate, a place for real talk about real bodies. Let's dish about our complex relationships to food and bodies. We are two experts in the field coming at this from an anti-diet, your body holds wisdom approach. This podcast is all about changing the conversation we have in our heads and culture so that we can embrace ourselves fully. Hi, Jenny. I am super excited because I really want to talk to you about this, this feeling of being out of control that I know we both hear about. It feels so relevant right now. Yeah, you know, just to take you behind the scenes, how do we come up with what we're going to talk about, right? So mm -hmm. as we record this, and I imagine for some time to come, the Israeli war is going on and we are recording here in the United States, and we are now involved as well. And it really led us to talking to each other about what do we do when we're in situations where we just feel we have no agency, we're a bit out of control, doesn't have to be a war, could be anything. And so I think it's a hearty mm -hmm. topic. I think there's lots to talk about. Yeah. And one of the things that you brought up as we were chatting about it, which is, yes, there's the war right now between Israel and Hamas, but there's a war happening in the Ukraine. There was just COVID, right? There's so many things that make us feel out of control in life. There are so many things that come up that give us a sense that we don't have the agency that we wish we had, right? We have family members who are ill. We have kids that just go off to college and we feel out of control, there's so many aspects, you know, to the reality that we don't have ultimate control in our life. I would say it's actually real and imagined, right? So there's the real life circumstances around us, yeah. some of which we think we have control over. Little do we know we actually don't, but we feel better thinking that we do. And then there are the things we acknowledge we really don't have control of, and we're not happy about those either, because we'd like to be in control. And it really is about perception. What do human beings want, right? They want to make a difference, and they want to have some agency. Mostly that's yeah. what people want. Oh, and to be loved and all of that. But they really oh, like okay. to have agency as well. Yeah. Jenny, I want to I want to give you like a brief example of how control shows up in my household. So my husband is Kyle. We've been married for a gazillion years. And one of the things that I've noticed for him is when there's big things that are really out of our control. There was a time where I was going through a big health crisis, when there's been times of war, different kinds of big issues that are not things that we actually can impact. He doubles down on this feeling of, I want to be strong. I have a sense of inner resourcefulness. However, if there's a spatula that is caught in the drawer in the kitchen and he can't open the drawer, oh my gosh, the fireworks, yes. the profanity that spills because there's this illusion in that moment, this should be controlled. Someone should have put that spatula in that drawer better. Who did this? How did this happen? Right? Well, this is, outrage. Is he wrong? I mean, shouldn't this battle <laughs> have been put in properly? I can relate. Oh, but that's not what we're talking about. Okay. <laughs> no, but there is that feeling of where can I control? Right. And, and this so desire like, oh, I got to do something about that. And where can we not? And so when we take this to beyond the spatula in the drawer, when we, when we get to the bigger things in life, what do we do when we really feel so much is out of our hands? Yeah. We do a lot of different things to gain a sense of control, right? Now, there are things that one could say are very productive, that are self-healing. And then there is this, this other group of things we do that are not so self-healing, but they yeah. feel natural and they feel like a reflex, right? So one of the things, you know, that's common, and I know in all well, the folks that you and I both work with, is to somehow want to distract, want to numb, right? Now, you know, one hopes that you can do that with any number of 
hobbies or things that really engage you, engage the mind, allow you to think about something else for a while. And then there are those times when you go to your go-to, right? So often that involves food, right? Yeah. And I cannot say this enough times that it requires compassion and curiosity and gentleness. Mm -hmm. Just notice it like, oh, that's interesting. Huh. Haven't done that in a while. Okay. And go with it and just see where it takes you. It has a purpose. Yeah. And there's two sides of that, right? When we go to food to feel in control, or one of the things that I see a lot is going to food to feel a familiar feeling. Mm. Oh, I'm going to food to soothe because I feel out of control. Now I feel too full, or I feel regret, or I feel shame. Great. That's a familiar feeling. I know how to feel that. That's almost, even though it's a hard feeling to feel, it almost feels easier because I've felt it so many times. So we can default to the eating behavior, unwanted eating behavior, because it makes us loop around that place of familiarity, around feeling bad about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and I hear, and I've been hearing this a lot with my clients who are really in this place of divesting from diet culture, who have really been feeling like a more of a connection with themselves. They're like, I don't know what's going on. I just feel like I want to go back to counting, counting the calories, counting the grams, counting the points, counting something. And when we unpack it, oh, I want to be in control of anything. And my default has been to try to control my body. And so at a time of unrest, at a time of feeling out of control, I'm going to default to restriction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, as you're saying all that, I'm thinking about the word control, right? Why, Mm -hmm. Why do we want to be in control? It seems like there's more responsibility when you have to have the control over something, right? I don't want to be in charge all the time, right? Yeah. I propose that it's somewhat about that. It's more so about, I don't want to feel afraid. I don't want, Mm. you know, know, just uncomfortable. I don't want to feel that I don't know how long something is going to go on, right? I mean, the pandemic is just in our rear view mirrors now, right? There were lots of Lots and lots of ways in which people found to cope, some of which worked for the long haul, some of which didn't. But again, it's so important to just stay so curious and imagine if we can observe ourselves rather than judge ourselves, just to observe instead of judge. That alone, by the way, puts you in control to simply say, okay, I have enough self-judgment. I'm really not going to judge this. Just taking a look here, like, huh? I say this a lot to them. Like, huh? That's interesting. Well, hmm. How did that happen? Mm-hmm. Okay. I think it's an important yeah. tool. Yeah, it is that sense of observation, right? Like when you're spinning out. One of the techniques that you know I talk about, many people talk about, is get yourself present. What colors do you see in the room? What sounds do you hear? What sensations do you feel? Right. Those are all embodiment exercises, practices that bring us into a sense of observation. But one of the things that you said, Jenny, that's just so at the heart of it is that feeling of discomfort. Mm. I am uncomfortable right now. And if we can just bring our awareness, this is uncomfortable. And the phrase that I often find myself using is, wow, this is hard. Because for me to feel uncomfortable feels hard. Mm. And so sometimes I'm able to get to, wow, this is uncomfortable, but I'm usually able to go, wow, this is hard. And then from that place. And under the, this is hard, I wonder for how many, it's also, I feel incompetent. I feel like mm. I, should know, I should know how to handle certain things. I should be able to know how to, mm-hmm. how to do certain things. I don't mm-hmm. like this feeling very much. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking about this in slow motion. In reality, mm-hmm. when these things yeah. are happening, you're not having this whole conversation with yourself, right? No, it's the two minute, two second slide in. Right. 
it's pretty instantaneous. And I guess mm-hmm. one of the things I'm suggesting is that you do slow down the conversation. You're going to do whatever you do. That's not the point. The point is to actually slow down the conversation enough to really just take 60 seconds. That's all mm-hmm. to just check in. And, you know, you talked yeah. about smells and sounds in the room. We're talking about grounding. Grounding yeah. is so critical. I, there's this wonderful method of grounding that I learned about in the last few years called earthing. I just love what it's called. And with earthing, you know, you can, if you're in an environment where you can do this, you take your shoes off and you walk mm-hmm. on grass, or if it's a blizzard, don't do that. But if you can just touch something in nature, I think mm-hmm. it allows you to just be right. in touch with what's around you in nature yes. on the ground. I think it's very safe. Well, it reminds you that you're part of, right? You are connected to the organism of human life, right? Of our planet. There was something else that you said that I want to kind of pull apart and because you and I can go right into the like, let's work with this because that's our tendency. But I want to highlight what that feeling of incompetence or out of control actually looks like. Because we may not be able to actually identify, oh, I'm feeling helpless or hopeless or out of control. But what we can hear sometimes is our old tropes around food that are actually a little bit like um, dashboard lights on our car that if they're flashing, we're like, oh, there's something going on underneath. So for incompetence, right, sometimes that gets signaled to us because we're like, I can't believe I failed again. Why aren't I doing this right? Right. So we want to hear what are the things that we're telling ourselves around our eating behavior, around our body when we look in the mirror, because we want to look at what's really the flashing light saying. It's not actually saying you're doing it wrong. It's saying there's something going on in the side, the vehicle, you. What's happening? What's the feeling? I love the dashboard metaphor. The word that I really am hanging on to and what you just said is the word again. Like, how many times have I done this? Or what does this Mm -hmm. remind me of? You know, even Mm -hmm. look, even when you seek out what we're going to call a comfort food, whatever that is for you, right? Whatever 12 Mm -hmm. things that is for you. When you seek that out, right? It's so easy to get judgmental. It's so easy to say, oh my God, I'm hopeless. I can't believe I'm doing this again. You know, what's wrong Mm -hmm. with me? That's certainly one route. I don't recommend it. Another route is to say, hmm, wonder what this is. Like, oh, is it the texture? Is it the smell? Is it how available it is? Is it something I used to eat as a kid? Is there a story around that, right? Now, again, we're doing this as a slow conversation. In your mind, it's a faster process, and it may not change the outcome. You may discover, yes, it is the texture, and yes, I ate it when I was 10, and yes, it was good then, and it's good now, and I want it now, and I'm having it, and thank you very much. And have it. That you know, There's no moralizing here about food, right? But it's to just turn off the judgment. That's all. I really believe that if someone you love or a friend or, or someone came to any of you that are listening and said, you know, I'm so mad at myself because I've depended on or relied on some behavior and I, I just wish I wasn't doing it anymore. I guarantee that you would not say to your friend, well, you're doing it because you're an idiot. So you wouldn't do that. But this is what we do to ourselves, right? Instead, <laughs> right. You, instead you would likely say, oh, you know, be gentle. Right. Oh, it's human. It's, human. it's, yeah. what, it's okay. Yeah. Right. Right. And what you're speaking to is self-compassion. And what I love that's bubbled up in the last 15 years or so is so much research about self-compassion from Christopher Grammer, from Kristen Neff, really on the forefront of talking about how when we talk to ourselves with that same kindness that you've just said, Jenny, about how we would talk to somebody else, Mm -hmm. how that's so much more effective in terms of supporting our well-being in terms of supporting our being an ally with ourselves than 
oh, come on, just stop. Just pull up your bootstraps. Let's get on with it. And coming back to that sense of, you know, I always call it like hand on your heart. Oh, honey, that feeling Mm -hmm. is so important. And it's not a switch that we can flick on when we have been trained actually to the opposite, to be critical. It's a practice that we bring into every day. I'm also aware as as you're talking about this, that there are many who are listening to us today who don't have a model to go by, that there isn't something they can go back to perhaps in their developmental years where they did feel cared for. They did feel that they could have a safe home base to run to. Well, you know, just yeah. you know, remember when you were playing kickball as a kid and, you know, just home base that they don't have that. And so when you don't have that, you almost have to develop a new one, one that you can rely yes. on. That requires being conscious and grounded and compassionate and kind and really being your own best friend in that moment. Yeah. And sometimes I find that the people who have no frame of reference, if they've ever had an animal it's often the best frame of reference because they have often been that to their animal, right? To their pet. And so they're being that kind voice. They're being that caring person. And so they actually have the model within them because it's showing up in a very specific relationship Mm -hmm. that is a supportive, caring relationship. And I want to reel all this back to how, when we're in this place of self-compassion and in this place of observing our inner critical voice, our inner, oh my gosh, again voice, oh my gosh, I'm out of control, what's the plan voice, like how that's connected to this experience that will always come at us in life of I'm out of control. Well, you know, it brings up, as you say that, it brings up this whole idea of the word recovery, which is probably Mm -hmm. its own episode all by itself. Recovery is a very controversial word because it implies in some ways, I was broken, now I'm fixed, now let's count Mm -hmm. the days. Except (laughs) it doesn't work that way. Except it doesn't work that way. It's such a bummer. No, it really is about understanding that, okay, this is my go-to, and sometimes this is what I do to cope. And what I hope for in myself is that because it doesn't wind up working for me in the end, that I'm going to do it a lot less often, and that when I do do it, I'm going to do it for less duration. But I'm going to know that this is always sort of lurking. It's part of my being, and there'll be times that I will be kinder to myself and not have to do it. And there'll be other times where I just, that's what I need to do. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's the coping skills, right? So if we go and we have to on a trip and we have a first aid kit and all there is in that first aid kit is ice cream. Well, okay. Then that's our first aid kit. And if that's been a great first aid kit for a lot of our life, it's Mm going to be our go-to. But if we can also fill that first aid kit with, I don't know, puppies and therapists and, right, and band aids and other things, then we have an opportunity to open that first aid kit. Wow, I'm having a hard time. This is very uncomfortable. I open my first aid kit. What else is in there? Mm. And sometimes ice cream is, and I'm not vilifying ice cream, not in a million years. But I'm saying if it's the only thing in our toolkit, it's the thing that we're going to go for. Right. So let's broaden it. Yeah, it's right? really about trusting yourself to make the choice. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, Jenny, that's a whole other thing, right? How do we trust ourselves to make our, a good choice for ourselves on our own behalf when often, right, a lot of the women that I talk to feel like I've never been trustworthy. Why would I trust myself now? I have yet to make a decision around food that feels like it's really on my best behalf. Can you imagine a world in which you have no fear of failing? 
just take this in for a second, right? Imagine mm-hmm. that the world in which you live functions exactly as it does, but there is no fear of failing. You can't fail. The best that can happen is that you get the result you wanted, and maybe you won't get the result you wanted, but you can't fail. Can you imagine mm-hmm. how many people wouldn't care about what they think other people are thinking about what they look like? Mm-hmm. They wouldn't care about what other people think about what they might be thinking about their station in life and how much money they earn or any such mm-hmm. thing. And imagine, mm-hmm. the, imagine the ease of being a parent and knowing yes. like, okay, this is either going to go well or it won't in any given moment, yeah. but I'm going to do the best I can. And I'll know shortly if it worked out or not, but not worrying about failing. I think it's right. such a core fear that drives so much of this. Yeah. And it's so important to look back. I know for me, where did I learn that fear of failure? It was really from diet culture. Oh, you did. You made a wrong choice. Oh, you have too many points there. Oh, you went over your calorie limit. Oh, you ate too many grams of whatever X, Y, and Z. Oh, and ultimately, thin is good, mm-hmm. fat is bad. Right. And so if the scale goes up, you have failed. If the scale right. goes down, woohoo, you have succeeded. Right. So the failure model came with us as women in terms of how you succeed or fail at being in a body. Wow. It's incredible, isn't it? Right? And so that fear of failure is literally in our cells. And so what you just said is imagine a world. It's almost like we have to re- train our brain, our body to be like, you know what? I am free of failing here. There is no failing. Right. And that's not to say we're going to live in la la land and everything's going to be exactly the way we want, right? It's about, I'm going to take each moment as it comes. And there are going to be things that happen that I'm very pleased about, very proud of. There are going to be things that happen that feel any range of emotions, maybe tragic, maybe upset, maybe angry, maybe whatever it is. But in the end, it's all part of this tapestry of my life and none of it is a failure. It's just the tapestry of my life. Hopefully it's something that I learn from with each experience. Now, totally, I have this meme in mind, you know, that I saw recently, you know, there's can imagine, you know, someone's holding on at the edge of a cliff just by the fingertips. They barely, barely, barely are going to be able to not fall. And the therapist leans over and says, don't forget to breathe, right? What I mean by that is I understand that all these things sound great in the moment when your neurobiology is engaged and you are in self-protect mode. Just yes. notice that you're in self-protect mode. And by the way, protect yourself. You can yes. always talk about it after you've protected yourself. You're going to go into some form of fight or flight or freeze. And mm-hmm. the idea is not to do that all day long because yes. that's where our bodies start to degrade. Yeah. And sometimes, if for some reason, the image a story came to mind when you were talking about like, we will end up in those situations. So. I have a wonderful brother who's a bit of an extreme athlete and a climber. So he took me and my daughter climbing, and it was a bit beyond my skill level. And it was a cliff that was overlooking water. And at one point, I was literally like hanging kind of off of this cliff. And all there was that I could see 600 feet below me was water. And I was truly afraid. And I could feel myself kicking in to fight or flight. And I looked down at my daughter who was like 10 feet down the cliff from me and my brother who I couldn't even see who was above. And I yelled really loud. And I was like, this is not nourishing. At which point my daughter, who's like also clinging to the cliff, just started to laugh. She said, mom, most people would be swearing, but nope, not you. You're like, this is nourishing. At which point I was like, it's not. This is hard. I am really uncomfortable. What do I need to be safe? Mm. And I literally screamed up to my brother, what if I can't stay holding on? 
What if I let go? And he said, I have you. Mm. I have you secure on a rope. If you let go, you will dangle. It will be scary, but we will get you back on the cliff. And I needed to know, like, am I going to be okay here? I feel so out of control. And often we need that. We need to be able to say, is there somebody here? Who's got my back here? I'm imagining since you're here to tell us the story that it had a happy ending. And <laughs> it did. Yes, thankfully. And it's interesting, you picked up something else, which is in the moment, he had your back. And yes. you trusted that he had your back. Yes. So many that have had trauma or abuse or any such thing have such a hard time, number one, trusting mm-hmm. anyone, and number yes. two, asking for the help, asking for the backup. You knew when he said to you, in essence, I, I have you, right? I have you, I, yep. I'm sure it just shifted all of the neurobiology that was going on in that moment. I mean, you were still very aware yeah. that there was water below you by however many feet you said it was, but mm-hmm. you knew that in the end, he had you. Yeah. You know, I'll say just simply because it's a much bigger subject. The behaviors that you use are your way of being held. And so some of the work is learning how to trust others and knowing that you don't have to do it all yourself, that you really Mm -hmm. can count on other people, that they will be consistent. They will be human, but they will be consistent. And that's, that's really a deep part of the work, I think. And Jenny, I think that's a great place to wrap up on, which is that, you know, if you're listening to this and feeling like you're in a place of out of control and all alone and helpless or hopeless, it is so important to get support. And as you elegantly said, it won't be perfect. It'll be human support, Mm -hmm. but it will be there. I always say this life is not a solo sport. It is a team sport. Mm. We need each other, right? You're listening to this podcast because you're looking for connection, community, support. And I want to say wherever you are, reach out. Mm. And as a way of wrapping us up here, if you're looking for more information about Jenny, about myself, Check out our website, herstoryonaplate.com. It has links to more resources, to more information. And also, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what are your takeaways from this? What felt important? What felt impactful? What's Mm -hmm. got you thinking from our conversation? We are here because we want to engage with you and support you in exploring and unpacking and healing your story of your body and your food. So thank you so much for listening. It's always a pleasure to be with everyone. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening to Her Story on a Plate. Keep in touch with us at herstoryonaplate.com. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time.